Hi everybody and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. This is going to be a follow-up video to the wiring up the DSPIC33 video which I will link down below. And this video is going to be very similar to the uh, video I did for the PIC16 F1508 that I'm going to put together a simple project uh, to blink an LED but uh, the few differences are I'm actually going to go through and show you where to find a lot of the resources that I use to create this project. So I, I apologize ahead of time if it ends up being a little lengthy. I think uh, uh, let's just get started. So m most of the resources to work with the pick all come from the microchip website and as you can see here in my Google Chrome I go to it quite often. So from the microchip website the easiest way I found is to search for the specific processor that you're using and we are using a, a DS pick 33 EP 128GP502 uh, enter. So once the search comes up, this uh, bluish grayish box is populated with all of the current parts that Microchip has available and this is the one we're looking for. So if you want to pull just the data sheet up very quickly, oops, uh, it's this link up here just sends you directly to the data sheet. If you either push this documentation and software button or scroll down here to documentation and software this is where all of the important stuff is so the data sheet is in here same link as the one above the rod is in here and I did a text-based post on this previously but what the really important parts are are these reference manuals these guys right here this whole list of reference manuals the reason for this is because this processor is so complex, they can't fit everything inside the data sheet like the PIC16. So each peripheral of the microprocessor or microcontroller, sorry, has a separate reference manual to guide you through that specific peripheral. Uh, these reference manuals, uh, as you can see, uh, are more genericized than the data sheet that this is a reference manual for the DSPIC 33 PIC 24 family and actually the DSPIC 30 also fits into this family as well. So let's get started. Let's uh, go ahead and open MPLOB XIDE. As I've mentioned previously mine is a little outdated. I will upgrade it eventually. I just haven't had the time nor the desire. You want to click the uh, new project button and microchip embedded and standalone project already selected. Go ahead and hit next. Like that. Now we want to, I like to just type in my processor uh, DS pick 33 EP 128GP. 502 like that and go ahead and hit next uh, we're going to be using the picket 3 like that and we're going to be using the XC16 compiler I have not checked in a while if this compiler is up to date or not uh, it probably is out of date but the way MP lab and these compilers are set up is that you can run multiple compilers so if I install a new compiler I can run the older version and the newer version back to back because there are some issues occasionally where they'll break something in the new compiler and you have to regress back to the old compiler to get it done so we're already set to the default directory for where MP lab saves its project so we're gonna call this the DS pick 33 blink like that so what I'm going to make special about this particular project as compared to the PIC16 I did previously, I'm still going to use a timer, but this time I'm going to use an interrupt instead of reading the timer register on its own. So what you're actually going to end up seeing is that my main loop will have absolutely nothing in it at all. So to get started, I like to do my configuration bits first. 
and I want to go to source file, right click on that and go new C source file. And we're going to call this uh, config. Like that, so now we have a brand new C source file that is completely blank. We want to go to window. There was a pick a memory views and configuration bits like that. And go ahead and double click on the configuration bits tab and it will maximize it. So some important things to look in here. If you want to debug this processor, you have to set this very first line correctly. So whenever we breadboarded the processor in the previous video, I used PGEC1 and PGED1. So this doesn't have to change. The JTAG is disabled. Uh, no issue about that. Uh, the I squared C mappings are irrelevant for us at the moment. Same with the watchdog window, the watchdog prescaler, postscaler. Uh, the PLL lock enable bit, which will not, is irrelevant also for us at the moment because I've decided to run this thing just on the natural internal clock. Uh, the watchdog timer we want to disable because for debugging purposes the watchdog will trip up your code and reset the processor when you're not expecting it to. Uh, the primary oscillator is disabled. Uh, we want to set OSC2 as a general purpose IO bit. Peripheral pin selection, allow one reconfiguration. We want to allow multiple reconfigurations, but it doesn't particularly matter for our purposes. Alright, so this is the important one. Uh, this is where our oscillator clock source comes from. What we're looking to use is the internal fast RC, but we do not want to use the post scaler because we want to run off the natural frequency of the internal fast RC. And I'll show you that in the reference manual. Like that. For us, because we're not switching clock sources, this one is irrelevant, and we want to disable any kind of code protects anything. So now that we have our configuration bit set up, we click this button down here, generate source code to output, and all of our configuration bits are now, can be copied out of this window right here. Go ahead and copy those. Minimize this and go ahead and copy them into the config.c file paste. Just like that. Something always note is this xc.h is always included. The xc.h, as I've mentioned previously, contains all of the mappings between memory and the actual registers that you're going to work with. I suggest including this xc.h in every single one of your C files. So we can't quite compile this project yet because we don't have a main. So now we want to click on source files, go to new source file. We want to call this main. And the, you can name them whatever you want. It's just uh, if you do stick to a consistent way of naming them. So my main file, I want to go ahead and include that. Um, uh, include the xc.h to do that uh, hit pound and start typing include you'll get a suggested box hit enter space you'll get another suggested box but this suggested box is for local h files we don't have any yet we want to go to the h files that come with the ide and compiler so to do that you hit shave uh, shift and the uh, brackets right there it'll automatically add the second bracket for you and you can start typing xc and that file comes up and you just hit enter xc.h like that so now we want to do our main so void main void 
enter, go ahead and open a curly bracket. And when you hit enter, it'll automatically close the curly bracket for you. Uh, something I've picked up recently is to keep to help you keep track of your curly brackets, even though it does show you how the bracket brackets link together. I've been seeing that uh, adding an annotation of what that bracket ends is very helpful. Just like that. And now we want to do a while one for our main loop like that main loop and now we should be able to compile this and I always like to use clean build uh, somebody once mentioned to me that the projects that you're working with are not ridiculously large so there shouldn't be any reason for you to have to use the build button because the real difference between the two is whenever you're using build uh, the compiler will only recompile the things that have been changed when you use clean build the compiler erases all of its previous compilations and recompiles it fresh so as you can see our build was successful there we go so now we want to first look at the clock and then go ahead and set up our timer so let's go back to here and we want to look at our oscillator module reference manual like that so let's take a look at the internal fast R uh, well first let's scroll down and look at the flowchart so this is the block diagram for the oscillator so this is our internal actually let's go with this uh, the the little square pins like this one right here and this one right here and these two are actual physical input pins to the processor so if you had a primary oscillator it would be connected here the rest of the blocks are all uh, internal modules of the processor so this module right here is the uh, FRC oscillator this is the internal oscillator and whenever we selected the internal oscillator with no post scalar we selected this branch right here where the oscillator just goes through to this MUX this uh, multiplexer because the post scalar what that does is you can divide the clock source here into a bunch of different uh, to make it slower into a bunch of different levels and you just have this 16 that you can program in separately a few things to note in this processor fcy is what's called the frost uh, is the processor speed the actual core FOSC is uh, the clock source to the peripherals and note that FCY without this dose feature which is yet another uh, divider to make the clock run even slower is divided by two right there by two so the core runs that can run or I guess the core runs at half the speed of the peripherals and that will be important later but unfortunately what they don't do is tell you what the speed of this FRC oscillator actually is right here so you have to dig further to find it and let's scroll up to the internal fast RC go ahead and select that guy so the internal fast RC provides a nominal speed of 7.37 megahertz and that's going to be the default speed of our processor. So uh, that makes it nice and easy. Okay, so now that we have the speed of our processor figured out, let's go and figure out our timer. And we, we do that through these this timers reference manual. And actually, let's use the data sheet for this because I think the data sheet would give us more information. 
or at least boil us down to the specifics that we need. So here is our data sheet. If you remember from the video, we hooked our pin up to RB5 to flash the LED. And that'll uh, become important later. We want to scroll down to the table of contents. I really hate that they don't put the table of contents at the very top. And let's use timer 1. resources and so there's a timer on off there's a timer one input clock prescaler select bit clock source and if you remember from clock source FP and FCY are the same. Uh, do I still have that pulled up? Because if I do, that would be amazing. Uh, oh, right there. FP and FCY are the, running at the same speed. Let's go back to here. And I was hoping this menu would give me more for other than just the configuration bits, but I guess they don't. So this is where we would use the reference manual. Okay, so the configuration that we have pulled up in the data sheet is for timer one. A That a type A timer is a type one timer. Yeah, a type A timer is timer one, and that's what we're looking for. So here is a basic diagram. Things to look out for are that. The TMRX register, the little X refers to a number, which is the number that refers to the timer. So this will be TMR1 for us using timer 1. Is the register in which the clock is counting up. So it starts at 0 and goes to 1, goes to 2, goes to 3, goes to 4, goes to 5, etc. The PR register, PRX in this case, will be PR1 for us, is the a period register. What that means is the TMR register is 16 bits wide. So it can count up to a large number. I don't remember what the binary component to that is at the moment, but we'll look that up in just a second. So, but if I don't want to count all the way to the top of this register, I can use the period register to trigger our um, to trigger our interrupt. So, because I decided that for this, I'm going to show you how to use interrupts. So, first we want to do some configurations for timer 1. So, the first thing is uh, our register name is T1Con and our bit name is Ton. What I always like to do is I like to turn off the peripheral or double sh make sure that the peripheral is turned off before I configure it. So, T1 con bits dot and now we should get a suggested menu and t on space equals zero and some few notes here timer one configuration like that it's always good to uh, write your comments as you program because you won't write them later i know i've done this many times and this is timer one off, like that. Now, we want to select the clock source, TCS, T1, oops, 
on boots dot TCS space equals and we needed a zero for internal clock zero semicolon internal clock F P like that we want a uh, we don't know if we want a prescaler yet or not, so let's go ahead and take care of that. And I always like to do this in Excel. So, clock F P prescaler uh, period and time. So our clock, we want to do this in megahertz, is 7.37 megahertz, or 7,370,000, like that. FP equals, to use a formula, this guy divided by 2, enter, just like that. So our prescaler, in what were our options, 864 or 256. Let's use 64, 64 like that. We don't know what kind of period we want yet, and as I said, we're going to do the calculation. It's 2 equals 2 to the 16th, and there are 65, 536, or 535, 0 to 535. So let's do a period of like 5,000, and these are the numbers we're going to play with. And now to do our time calculation, first we want to find how much a single tick is. So equals, open a parenthesis, it's, well, for frequency, to get the period of the frequency, it's 1 over the frequency. So 1 divided by the frequency, but because of the uh, prescaler, we want to divide that by the prescaler like that and like that. And then we want to multiply it by the period, and that should tell us how much time goes by. So, uh, 86 milliseconds goes by. Uh, now what we can do is we can juice this number. So what if we make this 20,000? I want to make the light blink about every half second. 34, so... 35,000, like that, a little steep, 31,000, what does 30,000 gives us? Close enough, but close enough for government work, so a period of 30,000 with a prescaler of 64 and a clock of 7.37 megahertz should give us about a half a second. So now let's put that all in. So for our prescaler, that's a TCKPS, and for a 64, it's one zero. T one con bits dot TKCPS space equals zero B one zero. Prescaler 1 to 164, like that. We want to set our period which is the PR register and to 30,000. And now where am I going? Over here. So P R1 space equals 30,000 and then um, prescaler for about half second like that. We eventually want to take this line and turn the timer on, like that. 
and let's compile it. And build successful. I like it. So since we're using an interrupt, we have to configure a few other things, and we're going to get that out of the um, that's the reference manual. We're going to get that out of the interrupt section of the data sheet. Okay, come on. Oh, as I said, I really wish they would put it at the top. So interrupt controller is what we're looking for. And what we're looking for specifically is this table right here. The interrupt vector details table. And you have to go through the table carefully. But what we're looking for is timer 1 and the registers that are associated with timer 1. So in timer one, we have the priority, the enable, and the flag. So what I always like to do is I like to clear the flag before I uh, enable the interrupt and then the enable the peripheral itself. For, so for timer one, IFS zero is our register. So IFS zero bits dot. And now we get this big table. And what we're looking for is T1 IF. So the timer one interrupt flag. Uh, come on, double click. There we go. Space equals zero. We have to clear the flag because the flag is what triggers the interrupt. We want to make sure that the interrupt does not trigger immediately when we enable it. So Clear interrupt flag. Now we want to enable the interrupt. Let's go back to the data sheet. The enable for timer one interrupt is IEC zero. So IEC zero bit dot timer one interrupt enable. This guy right here space equals one that enables the interrupt just like that so we're almost done we have the interrupt enabled we have the flag and everything set we need to configure our pins like that So let's scroll back up to near the top of the data sheet. And our pin is RB5. So we want to do a tris on RB5. Tris B bit dot. Tris B5 space equals it. zero looks like an O for output. And a one looks like an I for input. RB five input. Oh, sorry, output. What am I saying? Like that. And now we actually have to write our interrupt. And this is where it gets really, really, really confusing and in a hurry. Because how do you actually write the interrupt? It took me a long time to figure this out. So hopefully this will by me showing you this it will explain it further we're going to open up a new web page we're going to go back to the microchip website and we're going to use their compiler guides so to do this you go to products and compilers this is where you would download these compilers now if you scroll down under the documentation tab we are looking for the XC16 user guide. This is the the guide for the compiler that we're using. Go ahead and open that guy up. And if we scroll down through the table of contents, it, there's a whole section here on interrupts and how to write them. 
and it's a, it's a very fascinating read, but we're looking to get to some example code. Uh, this is example code for if you're using uh, assembler. Right here, so So looking through this, this will explain to you how to actually write the interrupt, but what I'm looking for, of course it's never easy to find, uh, there's a full example. This is the guy. Uh, no, not quite. Yeah. Let's do it piecewise. The PDS out of PDS. So something I already know is that. use this attribute and there's a whole section of that explains what auto uh, PVS or no auto PVS is so I want to go ahead and throw that in there and I actually want to use oops, no auto PVS and said I will leave it to you on interpreting this so what this line actually well let's uh, finish up the line so to finish up this line we actually have to go back to the website go to documentation and go to the x16 assembler linker user guide And I'm actually honestly not a hundred percent, I don't a hundred percent remember under what category that's in, but what I do remember is if I search for underscore T1, it will bring me up a table. There we go. So this is the interrupt vector table that the compiler uses to uh, link interrupts to their appropriate linked interrupt service routines, ISRs, to their specific interrupt. And this table is for the DSPIC 30. If we scroll down, keep scrolling. This is for the PIC24F. This is where you would find that table. And we are looking for the DSPIC 33. So if we look for timer 1 there we go timer 1 has expired TMR1 this is the primary name that we need copy go ahead and paste that guy in there and now we want to finish that with a void like that open a parenthesis close a parenthesis just like that so what this actually means is we are creating a function. The function's name is T1 interrupt, and this function name is specific that whenever the interrupt occurs, the program will launch to this function. And I'll do a more detailed video on interrupts beforehand. This section at the beginning here tells the compiler that this is, this is going to be an interrupt and to place it into that specific section for the interrupt. So let's go ahead and compile this and see if we get any errors. Build successful, I like it. So to finish this up, we need to add two things to the interrupt. First, the interrupt has to do something. In this case, we want to 
make the interrupt blink, blink mode. So let b bit dot let b5. And as I mentioned before, there's a neat trick here to make a pin toggle, and that is to use an exclusive or bitwise with a one. Toggle light like that, and after the interrupt is complete, you have to clear the interrupt flag. And we already have a line for that. Control C, Control V, just like that. And let's compile it one more time. There we go, built successful. So now I'm going to uh, jump over to actually looking at the board and having it all set up. We're going to download this code into the processor and we're going to see what happens. And if nothing happens, we are going to try and, and debug it. We're going to see what happens. So this is my first time uh, trying to do a uh, picture in picture. So I'm recording what's happening on here along with what's happening on the screen here. So uh, please bear with me. So I've written the project. I've uh, hooked up the processor. And now uh, what I forgot to do beforehand is I need to turn on power from the pick kit. So go to set project configuration and customize. I'm gonna go into the pick kit options, use the drop down menu to go to power and then turn on the power and hit OK. So now let's try to download the code and see what happens. Uh, something that you will note with uh, downloading the code is the code is always clean built the first time you go to download it. If you download the same code multiple times, it will Uh, only clean build it the first time and if there are any changes it'll clean build it. The reason why it does a clean build is because it goes through all of the files and compiles them all at the same time to push them into the processor. So what's going on on the screen right now is the uh, picket here is getting new firmware downloaded. The reason for this is I'm switching families of processor. So uh, the the processor I was doing before was the PIC-16 and now we're doing the DS PIC-33 and so that the controller needs to download a new firmware to work with the new processor. A few things, well first of all, ta-da, it's blinking. So we actually didn't have to do any debugging, everything is working right off the bat. But a few things to note. Uh, the first thing in most of it is in this uh, picket 3 uh, output window. Target detected means that the uh, picket found a well, found power on the board, but since it's supplying power, that's irrelevant. Uh, the other thing you're looking at is the, the that's really important is this section right here the uh, programming programming verify complete uh, that tells you that the software has successfully downloaded into the processor what I think I'm gonna do is once uh, my next video is gonna be some common things that are problems with loading software into a PIC microcontroller because it's very, very common to have a specific handful of errors. So I'm going to show you a video of uh, what those errors mean and how to deal with that. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I said, if you uh, like my videos, please give me a thumbs up on uh, YouTube. And uh, if you're enjoying my videos, also please subscribe uh, both on YouTube and on my website.